The English Reformation started over Henry VIII's rejection of the Pope's authority over the church in England. None of Henry's sons by his first wife survived infancy and she couldn't have any more children. So Henry had his eye on a younger woman. But the Pope, ruler of the Catholic Church, wouldn't allow Henry to divorce his queen and marry the other woman. So in 1534, Henry forced the Parliament to enact the Act of Supremacy, which decreed that the king held supreme authority over all matters, spiritual as well as secular. Without the Roman Curia's authorization, Henry usurped the Pope's authority over England's Catholic Church, which was, prior to the Reformation, the only recognized church in England. By forcing his subjects to adhere only to his own doctrines, Henry also usurped the Holy Spirit's authority as the teacher of God's people. Ephesians 1.22 teaches that Christ is head over all things which pertain to the church, and this would include earthly matters, not just heavenly. Ephesians 4.15 states that Christ is the head of his body, the church. Nowhere does it state that secular rulers are allowed to dictate doctrine in the church. Ephesians 5.23 refers to Christ not only as head of the church, but savior of his body. Scripture never bestows such comprehensive spiritual authority upon any mortal man. You can't pick what you like out of a job description and ignore the rest. If Henry made himself head of the church, did he also consider himself its savior? In the name of unconditional submission to authority, Henry savagely executed thousands of dissidents, both Catholic and Evangelical, for refusing to endorse his right to control the spiritual lives of God's people. Some believe Henry actually added the words, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever to the Lord's prayer. There are numerous warnings in Scripture against adding to the word of God. Far from being God's saintly regent on earth, Henry was a serial adulterer who lusted after other men's wives and went through six wives of his own trying to get a male heir. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 teaches that adulterers shall not inherit the kingdom of God. How then could such a lascivious man demand submission to himself as head of Christ's church? Cardinal Fisher and Sir Thomas More martyred under Henry VIII for refusing to endorse Henry's right to play God, correctly taught that no temporal ruler has the right to make himself head of Christ's church or formulate church doctrine because that is the bailiwick of church councils to do that. Henry prided himself on knowing his Bible inside out. But how could he have missed this example from Second Chronicles 26, 16 through 21? King Uzziah of Judah incurred God's wrath when he usurped the priest's prerogative to offer incense in the house of the Lord. Interfering in religious matters was not part of a king's job description. Uzziah was out of order and God punished him for it. Those who push the unconditional obedience doctrine quote 1 Peter 2.13 which teaches submission to earthly laws and authorities. But if the Apostle Peter really did teach absolute unconditional obedience to earthly authorities, Peter didn't literally follow his own advice. In Acts 5.29, Peter said to the Jewish religious leaders, We ought to obey God rather than men. Again, in Acts 4.19, the authorities warned Peter and John to stop preaching about Jesus. 
repeat her response by telling them to decide whether it's more important to listen to them than to God. Henry VIII knew his Bible well, but he only practiced those parts which didn't cramp his style. Henry imagined himself to be another King David, conveniently forgetting the terrible price David paid for committing adultery with another man's wife and then plotting the death of the woman's husband so he could keep the wife. As Henry butchered religious dissidents who disagreed with his usurpation of Christ's headship of the church, he disregarded the examples of conscientious disobedience committed by the Apostle Peter. In numerous references, Paul teaches Christian slaves to obey their earthly masters and to please them well in all things. With no exceptions mentioned, but in the same breath, Paul teaches them not to be men-pleasers. So how can you obey some tyrant and please him well in all things without being a men-pleaser? Not only that, in 1 Corinthians 7.23, Paul teaches, You are bought with a price. Be not the servants of men. Well, how can a man serve some human master without being the servant of that man? If you serve someone, you're functioning as his servant by sheer definition. I see glaring contradictions here in Paul's teachings. It's like opening up a can of worms. Not every Christian is clever enough to read through the lines so they can harmonize clashing scriptures. Keep in mind, Paul, a free male, urged faithful obedience to all masters, good and evil alike. Romans 13.2 warns that whoever resists the ruling powers resists God and will be damned. But if some slave girl felt that she had to resist her master's demand for immoral sex, would she have been damned for resisting his authority, even in the interest of keeping her integrity as a Christian? And if she did so, she wouldn't have been pleasing her master in all things. To further complicate matters, Paul teaches that fornicators will not inherit the kingdom of God. So does that poor slave girl have to break one of Paul's commandments to keep another so she won't be shut out of heaven and be damned to hell? Where would unconditional obedience have left poor Joseph, the Old Testament character who refused to commit adultery with his master's wife who lusted after him? As Joseph's mistress, this woman outranked him and ordinarily Paul would have expected a slave in Joseph's position to follow orders and do a good job for the ruling authority. But obedience to human authority would have resulted in the sin of adultery and Joseph felt bound to keep God's higher laws of faithfulness and chastity. Revelations 13 teaches that the Antichrist will rule the world after the rapture of the saints. The Antichrist will force everyone from every walk of life to receive a mark, possibly some type of microchip, in either their right hand or their forehead to show their loyalty to him. But Revelations 14, 9 through 11 warns that those who take this mark will fall under God's wrath and that person will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of God and his holy angels. The Antichrist will be the supreme earthly authority during the Great Tribulation period. Paul teaches obedience and faithful service to earthly rulers. But if obedience to human authority takes the form of committing an unpardonable sin and being damned to hell, this commandment must be set aside in order to give priority to obedience to God's higher authority. Inability to sort out and correctly apply conflicting scriptures carries great risks. Some simple, undiscerning soul could plead 
that he was only following Paul's orders and submitting to every ordinance of man by taking the mark of the beast. I remember one church elder who said that no matter what, wives should submit to their own husbands in unconditional obedience, even to the extent of jumping off a cliff if he ordered her to do it. But Peter says in Acts 5.29, we ought to obey God rather than man. Who's right here? And as for deliberately hurling yourself off a cliff and some misguided hope that God is obligated to keep you from harm. This sounds like the time the devil quoted scripture from Psalms 91 to tempt Jesus to jump off a high mountain to see if God would keep Jesus from getting hurt. Jesus countered one misapplied scripture with another scripture. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. No one has the right to force another believer to go beyond the boundaries of his faith and recklessly rush into a dangerous situation to put God to the test. Whenever the will of your earthly overlords conflicts with the will of God, you must choose God every time. If a brutal husband orders his wife to stay with him so he can endanger her life and abuse the kids, she must act as her children's protector. God called the husband to be the protector of the family. An army general reigns supreme in his battalion. But if he gets captured by the enemy in battle, he is unable to continue his command. His second in command must take over his duties or the men will have no one to keep up their morale and lead them safely through the battle. When the husband has been taken utterly captive by Satan and is doing Satan's work of steal, kill, and destroy, it is then that the wife must assume the role of protector of the home and take steps to protect her own family from harm, even if it means leaving her abuser and finding a safe place to stay until she can find some way to go forward with her life. As for the ministry of the church pulling rank on so-called pew Christians to tell them how to discipline their kids, I'm against it. Corey Ten Boom was a faithful Christian who was mightily used by God to save souls. She and her sister, as well as their father, were imprisoned in concentration camps during World War II for protecting persecuted Jews. Corey had a wonderful family life. Despite the fact Corey claimed her father never spanked his children, she turned out very well. Most fundamentalist preachers would say it's impossible to raise a well-behaved child if you don't beat them like a rug at least once a week to get the dirt out of their souls. There seems to be a one-size-fits-all approach to child rearing in Christian circles. People who don't toe the party line and obey Solomon's injunction to beat their children are accused of poor parenting. Regardless of the fact Solomon ended up as an idol-worshipping, slave-whipping tyrant who refused to take his own medicine for his own sins, and his own son grew up to be a cruel king. I remember how frequently children were spanked at church when I was younger, though I never saw any toddler throw a tantrum or talk back to an adult. Sometimes children twitched in their seat as tired toddlers will do during a protracted service. But those kids were quiet as a mouse. Yet time after time, some tiny child would be hauled off to the back room of the church for a whipping. There was subtle pressure for all parents to treat little kids that way just because some grinning preacher published a bestseller book teaching Christian parents how to beat holiness into their kids' backsides. No exceptions were to be made even for tots who were too tiny to realize they could go to hell 
for breaking wind in church. No kidding, the only time I was aware of any disturbance involving children at that church happened on one occasion after the service when the kids would run around the front lawn and play. That night a family of sinners attended. Seems one of the church boys got in a scuffle after rebuking a roughneck kid for smoking on church grounds. The little smoker got mad and took a swing at the other boy. Naturally, the kid had to defend himself. Other than this one incident, those children were as peaceful as Ned Flanders. On more than one occasion, I heard about grown Christians who committed far more serious sins which hurt other people. But not once did these villains fess up and go to the back room to take their licks. There was one law for adults and another for kids. I never read that gentle Jesus ever beat any child when he was on earth. If a parent treats their child with gentleness and consideration and praises a child's progress, instead of constantly demanding perfection, a warm, loving relationship results and that child will grow up to be a happy, secure adult who values other human beings instead of acting like a bully. Someone told me that their pastor, egged on by his young, overzealous elders, started a 24-hour prayer chain. Shout for Victory Church, the name changed, was a tiny country church composed of a few families with small children. They drew up a schedule whereby each man or woman reported to the church building in one-hour shifts, both day and night. This meant having to get up in the middle of the night, disturbing the family, getting dressed, driving to church, and waiting for troubled people to phone in. Aside from the fact this continual stream of traffic to the church created havoc, it makes me wonder how well an amateur phone counselor could handle a mentally unhinged individual who might need a well-trained therapist. The church prayer chain was supposed to be permanent, but for some reason it fizzled out. At least once a year, this particular church's leadership would call a three-day church fast. Able-bodied adults who didn't participate were suspected of loving Jesus a little less. In other videos and writings, I explore the reasons why fasting is not a biblical requirement for the New Testament church. If you're in deep prayer for extended periods and don't feel like eating, you don't have to. But contrary to popular belief, fasting to punish the body will not help Jesus pay for your sins or turn you into an angel. Fasting to earn credit with God gives rise to spiritual pride and one-upmanship. It will not purchase one solitary benefit from the hand of God. Tithing is another touchy topic where church authorities turn the screws on their parishioners. In other videos and articles, I explore all the reasons why church tithing is utterly wrong and it's a sin for church leaders to demand it or even allow it. Paul teaches Christians to pay government taxes, but not once does Paul authorize church leaders to act as a tax collector for Jesus and commandeer 10% of a man's wages. Even church leaders must bow to what scripture teaches the New Testament church. It is wrong for religious leaders to take money from a hungry, struggling family, when in fact the better off are instructed to give to the poor, not take from them. Shout for Victory Church disfellowshipped a family of missionaries they had sent overseas because they'd made friends with some minister who differed on one or two minor points which had no bearing on the essential doctrines of salvation. These people were to be cut off without any further financial or spiritual support. 
Scripture only recommends excommunication for those who commit such serious sins as adultery or idolatry. It is not a grievous sin to believe in pre-trib instead of post-trib. No church authority has the right to stop Jesus from loving the members of his church. Unconditional obedience is dangerous. Exercise common sense illuminated by the word of God, rightly divided and correctly applied to Christians of the church age. God gave you a brain. Use it.